What has Shell done since Louisiana to work on its spill response plan um, to make it make it more uh, more acceptable? And can you, I guess, in ever? guarantee that what happened in the Gulf is not going to happen in the Arctic if you start drilling there. So you hit me with a lot of questions at the same time, so Let's let me kind of break it apart little by little. Go ahead. Um, there is a lot of uncertainty. So when you, you look at these ventures, you always have what we call subsurface uncertainty. Are the, are the hydrocarbon volumes there? Uh, our own government says yes, they are. There's something like about 25 to 27 billion barrels of oil. 120 trillion cubic feet of gas, so it's it's significant. You admitted that uh, the resources that you have in the Gulf are not going to be available in the Arctic, and the, the the degrees of difficulty operating in the Arctic. I mean, that has to be a logistical nightmare, even on even on the best days. If you get a spill, um, there's just there's simply no way that you can get the resources. Uh, that you had in the Gulf, uh, working at the same rate in the Arctic. Actually, that there? That, that's actually not, no, it, it's not, and that's actually not the case. So we have a very different system. We actually deploy our oil spill response uh, equipment from the moment we begin to drill the well. Now, we can't have sheer numbers. We, we can't have 5,000 vessels of opportunity uh, floating around the Arctic Ocean, and I don't think the, the stakeholders particularly want that. We've designed a system that will work close into the well to capture the oil before it, it uh, has a chance to begin to disperse. So it's a little different. It's and we had talked about the volunteer fire department here earlier. This is not volunteer fire department where people pick up the phone and call and say the house is burning down. The fire department is already deployed in our wells in Alaska. We have our assets. Um, and one of the large assets actually will spend the winter in, uh, in Alaska this year, the Nanook, a 300-foot ice-classed oil spill response vessel, most modern in the world, that can work in ice, deploy a massive amount of recovery equipment. We go in and build upon that with some vessels of opportunities you've seen in the Gulf. More importantly, we have a mid-ocean uh, mid type of uh, response vessel where we are, are deployed some 20 or 30 miles off the, uh, off the area to prevent the oil from hitting the coast. And we have put together coastal stations for oil spill response. So all of this, these three tiers are deployed from the moment we begin to drill our wells. I'd say the three learnings we've picked up are, are first of all, accessibility to the BOP stack. So we're in shallow water, we can actually put a diver in the water and what we're doing is putting in a remote control panel away from the BOP stack that could be accessible by a diver, by a remotely operated vehicle, or even perhaps by a vessel that would allow us to manually activate the BOPs. As I discussed earlier as well, uh, putting in two shear rams in our BOP stack, which gives us an opportunity to two close more shear, Two more shear rams. Well, there's no, there's generally in a, in a BOP stack, you generally have four cavities. Right. Standard BOP stacks have one set of shear rams, then variable rams, and a couple high drills above there. So actually about six, uh, six operating units as well. What we, what we see is because we have very, very simple wells, we really don't need to put the variables in. We can put in a set of shear rams that really gives us what I like to say two bites of the same cherry. Very, very low probability that we would have something in a, in a shear ram that couldn't be closed, but this gives us two opportunities to do that. Let me switch gears to uh, the, the, the concerns about not just, not just the safety of the well, but even in general, even if everything went well. Uh, the Inupiat Eskimos of Point Hope have, have told us time and time again that if even you have seismic drilling, the migration patterns of the whales, uh, the walruses, everything up there uh, that they depend on for food uh, is going to change. And without that, uh, their entire life is going to change. I mean, is, is Shell willing to say that it can drill safely without uh, altering their way of life? Yeah, I think we are. And look, let me explain. So people can say that, and uh, we've had actually three really big years of seismic acquisition that we worked in conjunction with stakeholders up there. 
Um, and a lot of the same people you've talked to worked with us in setting up communication centers. We worked through a uh, what we call incidental harassment authorizations where we carefully tracked and monitored marine mammals. We worked through a conflict avoidance agreement with the whalers and uh, for three years we had probably one of the largest seismic acquisitions, modern 3D seismic acquisitions that Shell's ever done in an exploration plan. I'm not saying that it's something that we shouldn't watch out for and that we don't need to design around. And we is the big industry in this one and we don't want to come in and uh, like gangbusters overwhelm because their concerns are valid if we were to run half a dozen seismic programs up there and I think that's a real issue with insonification putting too much sound in the water and these are the things that we need to watch out for I think the drilling aspect is probably a little exaggerated with respect to the uh, impact it brings both on insonification as well as uh, is discharge. So let's talk about what we're doing and how we're working around that. So there's two realities here. The first is the way we've operated through these incidental harass harassment authorizations issued by NIMPS, the National Marine and Fisheries Service, as well as a uh, letter of authorizations by the uh, Department of uh, the, the Fisheries and Wildlife Department. And we have very specific routes we comply with things, for example, like helicopters. In other words, people have said, look, we don't want to see caribou uh, disturbed by your helicopters, and we are fine with that. We have altered our routes so we actually travel away from coastal areas to keep uh, the pressure off seals, walrus, coastal uh, animals. Same with our vessel traffic. We have uh, 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 authorizations, actually, that state that we have to stay um, a thousand meters away from walrus, for example. We're very concerned if we get too close to walrus, we could cause a stampede. They're huge animals and there can be mortality. So we put marine mammal observers who are people from the area, they're stakeholders, a lot of them are Inupiat hunters who understand and spot and help actually drive our, our vessels to stay away from any of these areas. It's not like to think one of the reasons I'm proud to work for Shell is because we really don't see a difference in how we operate in different parts of the world. Uh, so we are used to operating in areas where we basically have to portage everything in ourselves. And this is what Alaska has been built on. We, uh, we are going to bring in, and we have brought in, we've historically done this for, for literally a hundred years, uh, where we bring in the things we need to operate. I think the real advantage, and I, I love the fact that you've talked to people on Point Hope, well, there's other communities that are really ready to welcome oil companies in because it will bring some infrastructure. It will mean that they get fresh milk. It will mean that they get fresh vegetables and fruit and, uh, and meat and a lot of other things that are just difficult to get out there. Helicopters don't fly. Uh, there's autonomy. But what we'll do is, and what we always do, be it helicopters, ice, or anything else, is we'll peel back our operations. If we think there's something that's risky, that uh, you know you would need a helicopter access to do, we'll pull back. If there are ice is coming on, then we would think about you know entering the next phase of the well design or the well uh, development. Bottom line, I mean, if you can look at me and say, or can you look at me and say, what happened in Louisiana will not happen in New York? Well, I can say a few things about that, and you know, you and we've never said never with respect to oil spills. As a matter of fact. The environmental impact statements that we've done have contemplated oil spills, and by we I mean Shell and the old Minerals Management Service, so we've always contemplated the possibility of a spill. But will we see a spill the, uh, in, like we've seen in Macondo? And I think the answer to that is no. Um, we do not have that volume. Uh, we do not have that water depth. And we have a system that has contemplated the possibility of a spill from the beginning. And we've never tried to duck outside. If you look at our oil spill response plans, the sea plans, you will see walrus in there. You will see a walrus because we have contemplated all these issues. Uh, these plans have been challenged uh, and we believe they're robust. We're going to pick up some important learnings from the con uh, Macondo incident and really make our plans even more robust.